Inside the Connection, a podcast by HCTC, the Hill Country's leader in telecommunications products and services. Welcome to the premiere episode of Inside the Connection, a podcast where we take a deeper dive into the articles of our bi-monthly magazine. Our guests today are Jake and Carrie Short. Jake is on the cover of our May-June 2020 issue of HCTC Connection magazine, so I thought we'd chat a moment about their story and see what else we could learn. As with most things in life, there is always more to be told. So as we take a look inside the Connection, help me welcome Jake and Carrie. Now, Jake and Carrie, I um, I say that like we have a studio audience out here that's going to give you claps and rounds of applause, and um, it's just me. So um, just pretend like the crowd is going wild. So um, thank you guys for being with uh, being with our uh, we meet today on our first podcast as we try to figure out how this thing actually works. Happy to be here. Thank you for having us. Well, I um I do have my the magazine here in front of us and. Um, I, we do appreciate you guys, um, so gratefully letting us come out, take some pictures, uh, meet your animals. Um, and was that a, was that a first for you here or are you guys, um, you guys do magazine covers quite often? That was, that was a first for me for sure. Um, you know, we've struggled with our technology for the better part of nine years and, um, it, you know, the biggest one was our cell phones. When we left Houston and came to the Hill Country, we were just so entrenched with our cell provider that we, well, I should say I refused to give it up. And after about five years, we finally relink, relented and went with a different carrier locally that gave us a signal. And at the same time, we had that issue with the technology and working with Patrick at HCTC. I mean, it it probably was more my problem than his in the sense that I just didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but once, <laughs> once I engaged Patrick, I mean, you know, we really, he really worked with us and figured out how to make our situation function. And um, I mean, it, you know, again, I had a lot of frustrations in the beginning, but once we solved that problem, it, it really did change everything. So that's a that's a, a important part of your story, I guess. Coming from Houston, where you probably had the best in technology and um, probably the the best of everything, and, and you could get um, probably anything you could think about, and you could get the um, a service call, a service truck, probably any time, day or night, to take care of your needs. And of course, you come out to the hill country, and we're not quite like the big city of Houston. Is that what you found out? Oh, actually, exactly the opposite. I mean, really? Fantastic. The, the, the concept of being in a metro area is a little bit overrated in terms of the quality of services. Um, we, were, we were engaged in technology, you know, at the beginning, just like everyone else as it's developing. And it, we would go every other six months having to have technicians, you know, upgrading things. I, we have whole boxes of old telephone systems that we once purchased from our, for our offices in Houston, we no longer use. I mean, <laughs> wow. so, and then you add that, the difference in customer service, you know, the, the people that help you out here, you know, you're going to run into them at the grocery store or at church or you're, there are people that want to help you. Um, so actually we've, we found it to be much friendlier, warmer, um, and the concept of great service and technology, just because it's a metro area, is not necessarily true. <laughs> now, if we'd been Exxon and had our, our own AT, IT staff, that might have been different. But True. Okay. Well, that, that makes sense. Well, that that's certainly good to clear that up because, you know, we always just assume that if you live in the big city, then, as I mentioned, I would just assume you could get anything you wanted. And, and sometimes we... Um, we carry, or I do rather, I carry that chip on my shoulder that says, Hey, we can do anything the big guys can in the back of my mind. I'm like, I really hope we can do that. So, um, it's good to know that, that we can now in your situation, you'd mentioned Patrick, he did have to pull a monkey out of the hat, if you will, I guess, um, he had to be creative or think out of the box, all those 
things that you typically say about you know a, um, a solution that's not, I guess, the normal he had to do for you guys. So tell us a little bit about that. Well, so we were having, you know, the issues were we, we kept dropping. Our internet would go out, it would drop, whatever. So, you know, just with frustration and finally, you know, getting, I guess, you know, the, the key when you say, you know, how, how do we compare to the big city as with everything, the key is getting to the right person to solve your problem. Um, so once I hooked up with Patrick, I mean, we, he tested our, our lines and saw that we were in fact dropping and we weren't getting high speed. And, you know, so they came out and before we, as a troubleshooting, um, event they ran wires through our trees um to our various connections and we lived with that for almost four months i think um just trying to make sure you know because we live in the hill country on a rock um so bearing bearing lines it requires you know rock saws and man hours to you know run new wires so you know he was really you know basically said be patient with me um, and we'll figure this out. So we, you know, we did live with wires strewn through the trees and, uh, but we figured out our problem and there was, there was problems both on our end with our residents and our office where the wires were old and had some issues, but then there were also, we discovered problems at what I'll call the box on the road, um, where things were dropping at that, you know, so they were able to troubleshoot both ends of it. And then once we, you know, once we tested the system and got up to speed, if you will, um, you know, then they came back and we buried the lines and, you know, you wouldn't know anything today. You wouldn't even know the difference. Okay. But I would like to point out that it's not just technology. It's, it's your out here. It's your water line. It's anything that you've got to do. The geography makes it more challenging. Um, sure. And I think most people, after they figure that out, that you can't just fix solid rock, you you learn to accept that and work around it. Um, and it's like anything else, getting the, like a medical illness. Once you get the right diagnosis, there's there's usually something that True. can be done. So that was part of our challenge. I think it was just getting the right diagnosis as to the problem. Well, let's talk about the rock that you you live on, you know, as, as you called it. Um, I guess that rock is perfect for raising goats. Is that right? Is that what you guys yeah, uh, do? And perfect for it, right? Yeah, that, we, we, it's it's a rock covered was covered in cedar until we had the goats. So now we we have just the rock and the goats, not as much, <laughs> not as much cedar anymore. Well, that's but how many goats originally was to clear the cedar because they okay the cedar. Um, and it's they're about the only animal that can traverse their way across the the rocks to eat all of it. Even they even do better than various equipment we could have put on top of the hill to do the clearing. <laughs> the the goats do better than equipment that's <laughs> <Absolutely. Okay. laughs> they, they can get places you can't get with a skid steer. Right. And they don't they don't wow, okay. easily now they do get eaten by coyotes, and that's another problem. It's like every everything out here <laughs> gets another problem. So I, I am, the article does say that you have a donkey. Is that is that for uh, protection of, of the goats, or uh, why, why a donkey? Well, when we first moved here, um, we started with fifteen goats, and we wanted something to protect them. So we found this donkey on Craigslist in. Um, Blanco or something. Blanco, I think it was. And our son was actually playing football um, with Ingram. And so I took, went over with a trailer, picked up this donkey that had been semi abandoned but loved potato chips, and took him to the, to the Ingram football game in Blanco. And he, he hawed the whole the whole game because he didn't like being locked in the trailer for that period of time. Anyway, we, we made it back with Jimmy Joe is his name. And, and so Jimmy Joe is here to protect the goats from coyotes. And um, I don't know. If, I mean, I think he does a good job with the coyotes. I know that he picked our Labrador up and threw her about 20 feet. Um, <laughs> He's got a little too close for comfort. And he, he had tried to tell her, and she wouldn't listen. And sure enough, he picked her up and threw her. 
And so we let her out of the pen where he, where he is. And she sat outside the pen with her back to him the rest of the day. She was very mad at him. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so so that's what our animal, they all have personalities. I mean, people that have pets know that, that their pets have their own personalities, but so do every one of our, our animals that we raise, they have very distinctive, you know, and just trying to, you talk about figuring out technology problems. Animals are even more difficult to figure out. <laughs> that that makes that makes sense. Now, raising goats that is that's a that's part of your family business. Is that right? That's well, um, actually. Your I mean, I, career, I, had, I guess. Yeah, I had Spanish goats in the seventies when I was a teenager, and um, at that time they were about. I, I think you could pay somebody five dollars to take them from you. Right. Um, they had no value of sorts. I, I'm pretty sure that my father had them wrestled away from me so that we didn't have them anymore. Um, but anyway, I um, so when we came back, we, you know, we live on a property that has wildlife and um, really was covered in cedar. So we we truly got the goats as a method to clear the cedar. And it started with 15 we're now up to over 500 goats. Um, we have multiple locations. They're not all here. Um, but um, yeah, so we started out small and nine years later, we're, you know, rocking and rolling in the goat industry. Well, just as a point of trivia, um, Bandera County, and I assume the surrounding ca- counties were also um, a part of that, was the wool and mohair capital of the world back in the 50s. And then synthetics um, knocks knock them out of that position. So at one time, a lot of this territory w- was more park-like. More people had goats and sheep, and um, it was more part of the culture. And we see that coming back now. We see more and more um, people realizing that it it helped the land. Um, so you know, goats are goats are a unique animal in that they eat all the bad stuff in the pasture that you wouldn't want your cows to eat or the cows won't eat and they convert it to fertilizer and uniquely to the goats the seeds don't go back to seed so as they're eating the toxic weeds and such they don't reproduce them and so it literally in a cat we have a cow calf operation and the goats are enhancing the foraging for the cattle operation by cleaning up the pastures. And then of course, you know, living in the Edwards plateau area, we um, are working to get rid of the cedar trees that are depleting the water table that, sure. you know, really helps everybody in the area. So um, except for the golden cheek warbler, which we don't believe we have. Um, <laughs> otherwise we're, we're trying to save humanity with water as opposed to other wildlife well you know when you look at old pictures of this area it looks like we had lots of uh, grassy hills and we didn't we didn't have the trees and the scrub like we see um, out there now so i'm wondering if um, things like sheep and goats um, uh, goats primarily i guess would have been um, but they would have aided the grassy hills if they would have kept all the foliage and the trees down so that we have those nice grasses. Is that something that could have? I think that's true. You know, what I've been told, I, clearly I wasn't here then, but back in the day, um, the Indians would burn the hillsides and that would keep the seed, you know, obviously would keep the cedar right. at bay. And then, um, you know, once we moved past the Indian age and um, we went into sheep and goat raising, um, my grandfather had over a thousand head of, of uh, Angora mutton goats at one time and they just sold it. You know, they were doing the mohair production with them. And um, I heard stories from him that he told our ranch foreman at one time, you know, either sell the goats or shoot them. We're not going to keep them anymore, you know, because the market fell apart for mohair and subsidies stopped. And so that was, I'm going to say, you know, like, not sure the timeline, but maybe the seventies or, or sixties, I get 50 sixties, I guess. So the ranchers here sort of got out. I, I know with Kerrville, Charles Schreiner, you know, that was part of the deal. If you borrowed money from the bank, they, you know, you had to agree to 
have goats and sheep and, you know, in order to pay mm-hmm. back your loans and such. Sure. People were borrowing money for ranching. I don't yeah. think they made everybody have yeah, a goat. Yeah, true. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I think at the time that was the, you know, that was the thing that was happening. And it was also a profitable venture um, that, and it really did improve the pastures and, and keep things in check. Well, then when, you know, when um, synthetics came into play, Polly and Esther kind of ruined the wool and mohair. That was a joke. Um, sure. no. Yeah, that was a <laughs> joke. Sorry. Um, and Esther. <laughs> He's corny. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I think that, you know, the synthetics kind of replaced that. And so then again, the market, and that's when I kind of started was in the seventies. Um, and literally you couldn't give away a Spanish goat. Nobody wanted them. I mean, you know, right. you eat them for barbecue, but you know, having, I think at that time when I was a kid, I had about 30 head and um, anyway, so we got away from the, I think everybody or, or the majority of folks got away from it. There's still a handful of, of old ranchers here in the Kerr County area that are raising, I mean, there's a big push for the um, certified Spanish goat that is from the original bloodlines. And so you have the Siphons and the Kinzings up in Mason, Menard area and the right. um, um, the siphons are Weinheim, here locally. Weinheimers, you know, so the area is covered with old ranching families that have maintained that line of Spanish goats from, you know, back to the beginning of time, I guess. Oh, wow. Um, and so now there's a big push for them to be DNA tested and registered and, and tracked because we're we're part of the Spanish goat conservatory. And so we're trying to maintain those pure if you will, you know, if you talk to an old rancher, they'll laugh at you when you ask about a pure Spanish goat because it just right. doesn't exist. But there is a bloodline, and they they're they're brush goats that have been that have adapted and are able to live on their own. So for us, having other businesses, the goats are pretty much hands off. Um, we mess with them two or three times a year at kidding time when it you know. Um, if they need something or um, moving them from pasture to pasture. But for the most part, they do their thing and we just watch them. Okay. And he makes that sound easier than it is. And, and he forgets, the, you know, helping a goat deliver up <laughs> a day or, you know, those, he, he does forget all that. But that was one of the reasons we wanted to move back is we felt like there was some interesting heritage and important heritage con- to continue. And we realized living in Houston, as much even if we tried to get back here, it wasn't the same as, as a daily ranch operation, and we wanted our son to be exposed to that. Um, sure. And he he did once we moved here, he did raise some goats and participated in you know the livestock program, livestock show. Um, he didn't embrace it as much as he embraced baseball, but now that he's <laughs> a little older, he's he seems to be more interested, and in, we do think it's possible that it you know, he'll, he'll be the next generation that continues it. Oh, very nice. Now I'm I'm looking at the picture in our magazine and you do have, it looks like one of your best helpers there is your, your dog. And so people are going to want to know about your dog. So what, what, uh, what does he or she do? And um, do they, um, they work the goats or um, tell us about your dog or dogs. (laughs) You have multiples. You know, we are not shy at jumping into things. So um, even when we don't know what we're doing, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, even when we don't know what we're doing. So we jumped into goats, 15 of them, now 500. As the herd grew, Carrie decided she would not block the billy goat from running through the through the pens. So I had to get some other help that was more compliant to my verbal command. I am not a good goat herder. <laughs> I'll admit it. So um, we first got Craig. He was our first herding dog, Border Collie. And um, he came to us trained, and then um, he, as he, as he's aged, he's had some seizure issues, so his commands have gotten kind of um, messed up in his head. So if you tell him to go <laughs> left, he goes right. And- <laughs> <laughs> so we I had, had the to- same trouble with Kate. Uh, so we we had to get a, a a new dog, which is who's in the picture there. His name is Glenn. And Glenn is a two-year-old and still in training, and he doesn't really follow commands either just because he hasn't been trained as much as Craig was. 
Um, so I struggle with my helpers all the time, <laughs> wife included. And um, so we have the two herding dogs, but then because we moved the goats to our other ranch that is more remote and covered in coyotes, we actually introduced um, Pyrenees and Anatolian Shepherds as guard dog okay. as a first um, for our ranch anyway. And so we started with a male and female pair, got them back, got them from a guy in Oklahoma, got them home and found out that the female was pregnant. She later, within a 30-day period, had 10 puppies. Oh, wow. So, um, at one time, we had something like 18 dogs that we were <laughs> So when you think about the dogs, you kind of open this can of worms. Okay. Um, so now we're down to about nine dogs in the pasture that guard the goats, and we have two herding dogs that actually, you know, try to get the goats to go where we want them to, when we want them to. And um, literally, we were introducing just this past weekend. We were introducing um, Oryx and Oryx into the herd that we got from the um, which ranch do we big get? Iron ranch. The Big Iron Ranch um, out here, also in Kerr County. <laughs> And unfortunately, as soon as we, we got the oryx, the coyotes attacked it the next day. And so oh, wow. Jake's been having to go out every day or every other day and, and dart it with an antibiotic because fortunately he didn't, they didn't kill it. So when we, we went yesterday and there with the oryx was just one of the Pyrenees just staying there with it, taking care of it. Um, wow. They, they bond with the animals that they're raised with, and they take care of them, live with them. They're perfectly friendly most of the time to humans that they know. Well, ours are anyway. Um, there's, just, there's, you know, the thing about guard dogs, when you, when you read about them, it's, there, you know, there's so much information that's, that is, you know, conflict. You might say conflicting. It's not, I don't think it's so much conflicting as it is. There's just differences in dogs as there is humans. And, sure, sure. You know, they're taught to be a certain way. Um, some people say you should never talk to the dogs and let them be with the goats and do their job. Um, we have too many people around us. We have, you know, clients that come to the office. The dogs have to, you know, we can't have a dog that's not human friendly. Um, so we socialized our dogs. So they're very friendly in the pasture. They'll come up and get their ears rubbed. We try not, we, we were giving them treats, but that made all our, um, deer hunters mad because they thought anytime a vehicle came in the pasture, they were going to get a treat. So we had to quickly change our method <laughs> of reward. So now they just get their ears rubbed as their only reason. Um, and that doesn't really, it's funny. that doesn't keep them as interested in you very long. So the deer hunters are a little bit happier with us. <laughs> um, but, um, so the, the dogs are friendly for our, in our case, but other dog, another dog you might see, um, at another ranch or whatever may be just vicious. You know, I thought when we first did it, these were attack dogs. You know, I was really worried about wow. it because sure. I've read stories on the internet in Colorado in the mountains where they would attack bicyclists coming, you know, through a national park oh, wow. or whatever. And the dogs were there with their sheep or goats to protect them. And the bicyclists would ride through and the dogs would attack the bicycle. And I, you know, so when you first get started in this thing and you don't know anything, there's just, right. There's so much info that it, it conflicts and you kind of have to, like I said, you kind of have to jump in with both feet and just say, okay, let's, let's figure this out. And make it work for us. Well, you know, if people are, and we hear, especially in light of COVID and, and the recent news, you know, more and more people are looking at finding a plot of land someplace that they can retire to or even, you know, relocate their whole family. And what we discovered to, that took us a number of months, if not years, to figure it out is, you know, some of your your new top of the, the list priorities you know, your technology provider, your feed store, your veterinarian. I mean, those are the businesses, um, your your hardware or, I mean, that's where we spend all of our time with those places. Those are the ones that make it possible to be here. Um, 
Yeah, the the C, the CVS and Walgreens is probably low priority. Um, <laughs> in Houston, it might have been one of the top two or three spots. <laughs> Right, um, and, and same thing with restaurants. You know, you eat in the in the cities. You you have a tendency to eat out more just because there's more opportunities to do it. It's easier. And um, you know, out here you may be working until nine o'clock at night, and there's not a restaurant open. Sure, <laughs> there is one well, actually, um, but um, they're, they're kind so. Of- let's talk real quick about um, so branching off of that with the whole virus COVID scare that you know, a lot of people have been working from home. Um, my guess is that maybe your guys' life didn't change all that much it or, or did it? Busier than ever. And we took Busier the, than ever. Yeah. Okay. We took the opportunity to burn a lot of cedar um, with Jake's business as a financial consultant. You can imagine a number of his clients just wanted to talk, um, wanted to, you know, what's, what's going to happen next. Um, Right. So there was, there was, he had a lot of additional activity going on. And then the minute it opened up, our phone was ringing off the wall. We're coming. We're, we're coming to visit you, whether we, whether you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so our setup, when we left Houston, we, we set up our office operation to accommodate clients from Houston, you know, from out of town. Um, they're not just Houston. Um, and so we have a guest house and a way to accommodate multiple generations so when they come out we can do planning um, financial planning estate planning talk about money um, and just kind of enjoy a weekend and so you know they this is now we're starting our ninth year um, people know the routine all they have to do is call and say hey you know is is it available and um, so pretty much the phone like she said when the, when they said you can you know, get out, our phone started ringing and we've had people here almost every day since. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is there going to be a, um, another rush kind of like the California rush to Texas? Is there going to be another big Houston rush out to the Hill country that, um, we can credit to calls that we're um, you guys? We, we had a couple here this weekend that looked at property. We had, um, another, some other friends, so we've got to get out of the city. We're liquidating everything. <laughs> um, based on just, you know, our own anecdotal experiences, yes. <laughs> it would be a rush. Um, and hard to blame them. I mean, we we take we have taken for granted what we have. I mean, even though we sure. did very intentionally, it's we didn't experience the negative effects of being quarantined like a lot of the rest of the world here in the Hill Country. So, and then we were blessed with great, you know, government management. Um, sure. And that wisdom is a hard thing to come by. And I think we do have some, some very great people running our county. So what would you tell, um, what would you tell the snowbirds that are visiting down here or, or your friends from Houston or, or Dallas? What, what final words would you tell them as far as um, now that you guys have made the switch? Um how would you encourage well, them? I, I would tell them to, uh, they need to look out in Sonora. <laughs> um, you know, there's better deals they can find at Sonora. Well, um, no, no. We have, we have service in Sonora too. So in fact, it doing so gosh, do we really want to tell everybody how great it is? Um, I got you. Yeah. But yes, we do. We tell them these are, you know, there's so many advantages in, I think a lot of people just instinctively want to come dig in the dirt and be closer sure, to the land sure. and be able to breathe well, fresh air. Well, what, what brought us here nine years ago was an aha moment or, or as Carrie says, our win moment. And um, it revolved around family health issues, both my own and my father's. And so we kind of just said at that, mo- at that point, it's like, okay, we've, we've kind of knew we would always come back home, if you will. Um, but that was our win moment. And so we moved. Okay. And I think what the virus fought, you know, on the heels of a very active, you know, nine year hurricane season or 10 year hurricane season, I think people definitely in the Houston area are going, okay, this might be our win moment. We might just be tired of the whole process. <laughs> sure. Sure. Absolutely. Um, well, I, I will tell this one joke about electricity. 
when we first moved out, we had an electrician come out to look at putting our house on uh, a generator. And he, he sort of looked at the house and he scratched his head and he looked at us and he said, y'all must be from Houston. And we said, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, what, what makes you ask that? And he said, well, everybody from Houston thinks they need a generator. He said, we don't have <laughs> power out here. And uh, or, or he, <laughs> he said, he qualified, if we do, it's only for a few hours. And um, so we didn't, we did not end up putting a generator on the house, you know, because of his recommendation. That's a, another, you know, wonderful thing. The people out here, we find, we have found to be so incredibly, you know, honest um, and not trying to really do work for you at, if it's not needed. You know, sure, that's very, good. Very candid and upfront about well, this is what we can we can do for you, or we can fix it this way, and it'll cost you this much, or another way, and it's only, you know, or it cost you. Took us a while to even get oh some gosh. invoices for for some people. <laughs> wow, um, but that's that's great, great to hear. It's um, you know, we we always give people a hard time from and when they move into the area. But um, well, there's other thing we, I'd also just like to plug. We um, we also have this attitude that everything is better in the city when it comes to educating our children. And I know okay. we're under that misconception, both having grown up in small towns that, you know, all of our city educated friends must be smarter. And what we discovered is that the school system are perhaps not only as good as if not better okay. um, than than city than city schools, uh, metropolitan areas. You've got you know your teachers. The teachers know your children. They know the family. Um, right. There's no you have to go hire a tutor if your child doesn't understand. The teachers willingly want to uh, to stay after school or do what's necessary to help the children learn. Um, the the schools are are hidden gems out here that people. You know, I wouldn't say this is just a retirement area. It's worth it's worth sure. um, looking at this area for raising a family. Yeah, I I agree. And and for the record, I I'm was born in Houston, so um, I I may give Houston people a hard time, but um, I I love Houston. My family loves Houston. Um, my wife is from Houston, so. Um, Glad you guys are here, but we we do love people from Houston and glad well, they're here. We love it too. Well. We love to visit, and I enjoyed every minute that I lived there. Um, yeah, but there's there's pros and cons any place you live. That's for sure. Absolutely. Well, you guys have certainly shared uh, inside the connection. Um, I wanted to um, take a deep dive into kind of. Um, who you guys were and what you were all about. And I think we certainly have accomplished that. Is there anything else that you guys want to share that maybe you didn't get a chance to share with the, with the podcast or with the magazine? Um, you're certainly, uh, certainly ask you to, to you know, say it now. Um, I would, I would just close with uh, the community spirit. I mean, that's one of the things that's I think so important to realize is, is the how unified the community really is and how it tries to help one another. And, um, and it's, it's not something that's done by force. It's something that's done by instinct. And um, it's just the flavor of who, of, of who the people are out here. Um, and I think that's something that's refreshing, especially in this day and age with all the news we hear. True. That's good. Well, Jake and Carrie, thank you so much for um, giving me the time to kind of learn. That, like I said, this is our first podcast, so we appreciate you guys um, being the first one. Kind of our guinea pigs, if you will. But um, thank you for uh, what you guys do for the community. I I see you guys out and around a lot, and um, you guys are both um, integral parts of the West Kerr County community, and we really appreciate what you've done for the community and that you've taken the time to help, you know, support us as a company to say, you know, certainly um, good and happy things about us. And we're glad that as a company, we can support you as well. So um, we do appreciate it. We thank everybody else that's listening out there and we do hope you'll join us again as we take a look inside the connection. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks, Carrie.